The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, this is Sydney Eisen speaking, and along to get to, with me today is uh, Ken Merritt, the project manager for the Automatic Home Recognition and Machining, or otherwise known as AHRM. And by the title, you can tell that the uh, webinar will be on automatic call recognition and machining itself. Um, of course, at the end of the webinar, you'll have time to ask questions. You just write down the questions in the appropriate spot, clicking on the send button at the very end, and then we'll answer all the questions you may have. So uh, let's just cut right into the webinar itself. And uh, Ken, if you will, you can uh, start off. Great. Thank you, Sydney. Welcome, everybody. Glad you could attend with us. Today we're going to be talking about how SolidCam manages automatic hole recognition and machining. And as you can see here, the primary idea of this is to find all of the features and then machine those features. And so we want to talk a little bit about that and where, how it works and where you go to make this work. So uh, Sydney's going to be showing you in just a moment the process of walking through this to achieve the final goal of generating the tool paths. Uh, what you're going to see, you're going to see this kind of a layout that you're seeing here. There's several icons in here that we're going to select, select through, and each of these is going to do a particular phase of the entire process. Okay, So I kind of wanted you to see this chart, get a feel for how this works. And then as we get into this, Sydney is going to go ahead and take us through a live presentation of actually recognizing and machining some features on a, on a typical part. So at this point, Sid, why don't you go ahead and switch it over to your computer and let's begin this. Okay, no problem. Uh, as you can see, I have on my screen the exact part that you saw uh, when we opened up the webinar. And what I'd like to do is drill out all of the holes that you see on this part. Now, if you take a look at the part, it's, at, as you can see, there are many different types of holes here. We have holes here that are countersunk. We have holes here that um, have a counterboard to them. We even have holes that are tapped as well. So we have all different types of holes here, as well as being on different levels on the part itself. So we'll actually start the process. It's a very simple process, so let's go to, through the actual process itself. Now, if I were to go to operations on the left-hand side of my screen, right-click on it, we have an option here called Whole Recognition and Technology. And you'll note that there are several different uh, processes that we can use, but the default is called SHR. That's the default that's actually installed in the uh, SolidCam itself. We'll open up a SHR, and this actually starts the process of recognizing the holes on the parts itself. The first thing it has to do is actually recognize it. Now, let me show you again what happened uh, by re-recognizing so you can actually see the recognition as it's being done. This is exactly what happens. It recognizes all of the features, whole features, as shown over here. <clears throat> now, if we take a look at the left-hand side of our screen, you'll see now that we have what we call the list of whole features. Now, what are they themselves? If I were to click on, for example, Shape 1, what you'll see is that it's actually broken down into features of different shapes, and this shape one is sh showing us all of the holes that have that particular shape. Now, we have in that shape one, we've broken down into different groups because we have groups with different sizes or on different levels. So they have different groups for shape one. The same thing with shape two. It has these type of holes over here broken up into two groups and so on and so forth. Shape 3 as well as Shape 4. Now note with Shape 4, we'll get back to that a little later on, but note Shape 4 is actually a counter borehole coming from the opposite 
side of this part itself. And remember, we're working on a three axis machine with only one home position defined. So Sydney, actually what this is doing then is basically organizing the geometry that it finds into categories, right? That's exactly what it's doing. It's showing it into different categories. Okay. Uh, well, next thing I have to do is go to my next step, which is M features, which we saw in the diagram before. So let's go further into our M features. And with this and time, what is what is an M feature, Sid? An M feature is actually what we call a machinable feature. In other words, how a specific segment or a specific shape has to be, how it actually is built. What do I mean by built? If we take a look, for instance, at shape one, okay? Take a look at the bottom over here, at the bottom left-hand corner. You'll see shape one is made up of a drilling segment and a thread, as shown over here. We'll talk about segments a little later on. Just remember what we see over here. We see a drill and we see a thread. And that's what group shape one is, and it's broken up into different groups, again, because you have different side threads and on different levels as well. Same thing with shape two. If I go into shape two, you'll see that shape two is broken up into a drill and a chamfer. Now remember these, again, I'll show you these later on exactly what this has to do with the actual uh, defining of a part itself. So these are actually kind of um, defining them into the different categories of the whole process, if you will. That's exactly what it does. Very good. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Okay. So now that it's actually done this, we go to our next step where it gives us our feature sets. Now, feature sets is exactly what it is. It's a set of... Uh, different shapes that go into a specific home position. Each feature set is are all the holes that can be done in that particular home position. Now in this particular case we only have one feature set because as I mentioned before this is a three axis machine I only created one home position so therefore we only have one feature set. Now You'll note at the very bottom, we have one here called incompatible features. If I click on it, you'll note what it picked out. It picked out the counter bore hole that's actually running from the opposite side. Because it sees it's not inside that feature set. It cannot be created as another feature set because we don't have another feature set. So therefore, it put it at the bottom so it would not be calculated in this particular set of operations that we're doing right now. So said if we had created the coordinate system coming in from the other side, then this would have aligned a secondary set creating or, or organizing this particular shape and group into what could be machined from that orientation, correct? That's correct. If I had done another home position from the other side, then you would see over here feature set two, and this would be inside that feature set. Very good. Okay. Now let's continue on down. Now that we have it all broken down into a feature set, next we go into our technology. Now technology is actually very interesting. What it does is it's actually building the type of technology that we're going to be using for each one of those groups as shown over there. For instance, we have Tech One. If I have to click on Tech One, it's showing us that Tech One will be using the following technologies, which I'll talk about in a few moments also. It's be using a technology called Two Stop Tech Drilling and a tapping technology as well. Now, if I were to go into the group under, under Tech One, you'll see that is actually going to do the following. This is the technology that it's going to use. It's going to use a pre-drilled spot drill, as shown over here, a, pre, a prep drill operation, a main drill operation, and then a tapping. Because this is what exactly that particular technology calls for. Now, if I have to go in, for instance, to Tech 2, again, you'll see it's doing this time, however, 
PEC drilling and tapping only. If I were to go into the group, you'll see that PEC drilling has the pre-spot, pre-drill spot, and a PEC drill operation. So each one of these has their own type of technology that they'll use in order to do to machine those particular holes that's in that group. Okay. Well, after that, we're basically set now to create our operations. Going on to our next icon, this is actually generating the operations themselves. By clicking on it, you can see it's actually generating operation processes, as you see over here. All you have to do is sit back, and you see I didn't even have a chance to sit back. It created all of the operations automatically. And if I were to just right-click on them and edit, you'll see that's actually a regular drilling operation that you would normally create in a regular drilling operation without any kind of process. The only difference is this was automatically done through the whole, the automatic hole recognition and machining. Now, if I were to go through them, you can see that they actually have the values that are needed that were picked up automatically. And we'll show you a little later on how they got these values. And we have our levels in here as well. And in certain cases, such as the tools, we can even change our tool if we want to. Well, basically, we're done. And the moment I exit this process, you can see that in the tree, we have all of the operations needed to create, to machine all of the holes that are on that particular part. Now, would you like to see? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it looks pretty powerful. Uh, it is, actually. Um, I may have, you know, I may have talked a lot over here and stuff like that, but I really didn't do much. So, actually, you can actually see how fast it actually really does work. Now, uh, just to show it to you, I'll just run my simulation at this moment. I'll click on Simulate and go into uh, Solid Verify. Okay, I'm going to slow it down a bit so it'll give you a chance to look at it also, and I'll zoom in a bit as well, and we'll start running our uh, operations, the simulation. You'll note that it's drilling each set exactly the way it's supposed to, whether it be the tapped holes, countersunk holes, all of that is being done. Now, you'll note in a moment, let me stop it here, and I'll zoom into this area now. You'll note, I'll let it continue. Now note, at this point, these are countersunk holes over here. These are actually being hole machined out. These holes are being machined out exactly the way they're meant to be done for a counter bore hole. And I'll let it go through, and you can see it being done on all of those holes over there. Now I'm just going to zoom out and let it take the course of finishing the part. And as you see, all of the holes now are completed exactly the way I intended them to be completed. You can see the counter sunk holes over here, the counter boards, the tapped holes, all of this is complete. Okay, well, Sid, why don't we talk just a little bit about what actually just took place there. Um, sure. I want to show a little bit of what's actually going on here and how the system works with that. Uh, you should be seeing my screen now. Yes, we do. And the solid model with the hole recognition, what it's going to do as soon as the hole recognition begins, it's going to look for the geometric features and then, as you showed, it converts those into features that can be machined. Okay? And then, once it has the machinable hole features, it basically distributes those into feature sets that can be achieved from the various different orientations of the model because not everything comes from the top. Um, and that, of course, relates to our coordinate systems. Once those feature sets are defined, then the system actually goes in and develops the feature-based machining, which comes from the tool table and the technology database. And we'll be going into a discussion of the technology database here in just a few moments. 
from that, from the feature-based machining, then it goes in, the system creates the operations, which are then transitioned into the actual CAM part tree. Now, when we talk about segments, and, and Sid mentioned these earlier, we're talking about the recognition of geometric shapes that are relative to what would be considered a hole in our part. And there are several different shapes that can be recognized. They include blind shapes, they include through shapes, and they also include compounded shapes coming in from both sides of the part. We may be able to machine part of this from the top side, but need to flip it over and machine the other part of it from the bottom side. And so we need to categorize all of those things and make sure that they're oriented correctly in order to be able to do the machining properly. Now, as we begin to talk about the types of segments that you're going to see in what we call an M feature or machinable feature, what the system does is it works with singular face features or it also works with what we call a duplex face feature. When I say a single or a singular face feature, what I'm talking about is a single face geometry by itself that is the machinable feature. For instance, a cylinder or an open chamfer or a cone, a thing of that nature. Okay. Um, as we go to the duplex features, we begin to see things like a cylinder with a flat bottom, a chamfer with a flat bottom, a cylinder with a chamfer at the bottom, okay, or with a fillet at the bottom, things like this. So the system actually will combine these two segments into a particular feature that could be machinable with a single tool, okay? Now, the next phase of this presentation that we're going to go into is to talk about and, and get more deeply into the data structure that is used to develop these technologies and decide when they are to be applied to a particular uh, geometry orientation and so forth. So one of the things we want you to be aware of is that you can define several databases and, and we'll talk about reasons for doing that as we get deeper into it. But also the database you choose gets inherited into the CAM part so that if you needed to make adjustments to it within that part, you could do that without impacting um, the rest of the new features or, or new part projects that you might work on after that. Um, we can do this by the Save As button, and Sid will show you that here in just a little while. I want to discuss a little bit about some of the characteristics of the parameters that are going to be used in this so that when Sid's showing you this through the database, it's going to make a little bit more sense. But understand that we use segments, machinable features, as well as the entire whole feature. And so there are various different parameters that are defined by the relationship of the particular segment or by the relationship of the machinable feature or relative to the overall whole feature recognition. And so now as we get ready to go into um, the database, I want you to kind of keep these parameters in mind. And Sid, why don't you go ahead and take us in and show us how they can use these within the technology database to automate this process of machining a whole. Okay. That shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, we'll keep this part on our screen for a moment, but let's go into the actual database and we'll see exactly what it actually looks like. So if I were to go into SolidCam Technology Database, I'm going to open up the database that I use called the SHR database, okay? And this is exactly what the database looks like. I said, where did you get that database? This database is actually a database that's, uh, as a default, installed with SolidCam itself. So everyone who has installed SolidCam automatically has this database as well. Very good. Okay. Now, what are we actually looking at in the database? 
Well, if you remember when I mentioned to you before that we broke we broke it up into different um, technology operations, how we built a technology, I had pointed out stuff like drilling technology, flat cylinder, the different segments that we have, uh, chamfering, flat chamfer, threads. All of this actually is in our left-hand side of our tree over here. Now, how does it know when it sees a drill, how does it know what to do? Because if we go underneath drill, we have here something called drilling. We have here something called peck drilling, deep drilling. So how does it know which one to use? Well, very simple. If I were to click on, let's say it's told us to do a drill operation. Okay. So the first thing it does, it looks at the very, very first one, which is drilling. Now, the moment I click on drilling, you'll note that in the right-hand side of that, we have a set of conditions. These conditions actually tells us what it will allow us to do, what criteria must be met in order to do a simple drilling uh, technology. Well, let's take a look at it. The first thing we'll note, we'll have the expression. This expression over here says HR segment. HR segment diameter, sorry. What is the HR segment diameter? If we take a look, as Ken explained before, we had the, the actual um, segment the, the segments, and this is the actual diameter of the segment. If we take a look at the sketch on the bottom left-hand side. So the diameter of the segment is what we're showing over here. So now let's go back up here, and let's look at the following, what it says to do over here. First of all, it says, HR segment diameter, if it's less than or equal to the maximum tool diameter. Now, the maximum tool diameter is a parameter that we created, and we can see that over here. Now, what does it say over here? We have here maximum tool diameter, and we have it written at 25. So, if the HR segment diameter is less than or equal to 25, as shown over here, and has to meet another condition. The HR segment diameter is less than or equal to the maximum single drill diameter. Another parameter that we had added in, that I created myself, and that maximum single drill diameter, if you go down over here, is 10. So if the maximum single, if the HR segment diameter is less than or equal to 10, and the height to diameter ratio is less than or equal to the maximum drill height ratio. If we go down here, we have maximum drill height ratio as 2. So if this here is, say, 10, so if the height, the actual uh, height diameter ratio is 20, comes out to be 20, all of that fits the needs of this particular uh, all of these conditions over here, and then it will be doing the drilling. So, so Sid, what happens if these conditions aren't met? What if, what if one of these turned out to be a false statement? Okay, good question. For instance, like if the maximum drill height ratio two, and this turned out being uh, um, 20, uh, 25 millimeters, something like that. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. What, in other words, if these conditions aren't satisfied, what does the system do next? Well, the next thing it does, it goes down to the next set. It automatically goes to the next option technology that we have over here, and in this particular case called peck drilling. And then it has to meet this set of conditions. And if it meets this set of conditions, then it will do the peck drilling. If it doesn't, then it will go down to the next one, and so on and so forth. In other words, everything has a set of order in order to fill the proper type of technologies that we have to do for those particular holes. And can you can you add new technologies in there? Of course. Let me just go into, for example, uh, take the very, very first one over here, the drilling. If I were to right click, you can see we also have edit. Okay? So I can add another one. If I right click on drill, I can actually make a new machining process as well. But let's not let's not go make a new one right now, but we see that we can do it.
But let's go into the drilling one now and see exactly what that one is particularly made up of. If I were to go into edit, you can see all it is is just a machining process. And on the left-hand side, we actually have what that particular technology is going to do. In this particular case, it's showing us it's going to be doing two operations. The first one called pre-drill spot, and the second one called drill operations. Both of these, by the way, are regular drilling operations. So if I were to right-click on the first one, the pre-drill spot, and go into edit, you can see it's the actual drilling operation. That's all it is. Now, <clears throat> if I were to go into my tool, for example, you can see we have here the type of tool called a spot drill. Now, you'll note in the diameter, it says spot drill diameter. In other words, this here, if I were to go into select, this here is an actual parameter. Now, if I want, I could make this a hard code. I could write a value in here instead of a parameter. For instance, I could write a value in here of 20 millimeters. So that means every single time I get a spot drill, I'll always get a 20 millimeter spot drill. But that's not what I want. It doesn't give me the option of automating it. It'll only automatically give me just a 20 millimeter uh, spot drill. What I'd like to do is that up to a specific size hole, I'd like to use one size spot drill. If it's past that hole, I'd like to use a different size spot, a larger spot drill, and so on and so forth. So what I can do is just give it a parameter, and then we can actually manipulate the values for the parameter all the time. And we'll show that in a moment. So what you're talking about is a user-defined parameter, and then we can set the criteria for that user-defined parameter. Correct. Correct. And let me show you how that's done, actually. Okay? Let me just close this and get out of the operation itself. And let's go to that particular parameter called the spot drill diameter, which we see over here. Okay? Now, if we go to the expression for that spot drill diameter, it looks quite complex. Okay? But if I were to actually go into it, which is actually a condition that we've set up over here, you can see it's actually quite easy to manipulate it. Now, what I've done here is very, very simple. We have here the HR segment diameter. What I'm saying here is as follows. If the HR segment diameter is less than or equal to 5, so then the diameter of the spatula will be a 6 millimeter spatula, as shown over here. Now, else if the HR segment diameter is greater than 5 and the HR segment diameter is less than or equal to 11, in other words, it's between 5 and less than 11, so the spot drill that it will give me, the value for the spot drill diameter will be 12. And that's how we go on. Then we go on if it's greater than 11 or and less than and equal to 18, 20. And if it's large, if it's greater than that, in other words, else, it'll use a 25 millimeter spatula. In other words, according to the size of the hole that it finds over of the of the actual HR segment diameter, that's how it determines the size of the spatula that I want to use. So this really allows you to automate the tool selection. That's exactly, and this is, by the way, totally editable. You can actually edit, put in here any value that you want. Very good. Now, let me just click on OK, and say you made some changes inside your database you have over here, and you want to save it for yourself. Well, first let's do save and exit, just so you can save it. And now we'll go back to our technology database. We have here at the very bottom over here the option called Save and Save As. If I were to click on Save As, I can give it a new name. Let's give it a new name. Um, a good name would be, ah, okay, Ken. <laughs> okay, that's the name so of my You're making my, new, my database for me. Ah, well, it's your database. That's right. I just created a database for you. So here we have one called Ken. And this is a database that we can use later on whenever we want to. 
So we have a new database created exactly the way I want to have it. And that's basically it. Now, one of the other things, Sid, that we might want to reference right there is what are the reasons for needing other databases? Let's say a customer has several different machines, and each one of those machines might have different requirements in the drill cycles that they support. This would give you a very easy way of saving a database that you already have working your way and simply going in and modifying some of the drilling cycles to fit the capabilities of a particular machine in your shop. That's correct. And now, uh, another reason why you may want to do that's one reason. Another reason may, why you may want to do it is you may only have even just one machine on your in your uh, tool shop, but you're working on different types of materials. Say you're working Absolutely. on uh, aluminum, uh, stainless steel, uh, titanium, uh, coal roll steel. All of these meet with, meet different requirements. So you may want to make a database specifically for those materials. That sound absolutely. right? Absolutely. Sounds absolutely right. So it seems like this is very, very flexible. Let's take a look at some of the options um, that are available to a customer as they're looking at creating these database structures. Um, number one, of course, you have the default installed technology database. Um, we create that internally here at SolidCam. And over time, that will grow and change and, and be enhanced to do greater things. And so that's always going to be available to you through the installation. As we discussed, you can modify and copy the installed database so that you can make it a more personalized one. You can do that as the customer, or you can also contract us to have our engineers build a database specific to your defined, defined requirements of what you need for your shop. And we also have the availability of training you. Um, this, this particular webinar is more of an exposure webinar. We're trying to get you aware of what's available here. We can go into a different type of alignment here where we can actually do a full-on training class and teach all of the different characteristics that are necessary for building these data structures to whatever level you want them built to. Okay, so remember there are several options. You can contract that through us, we can train you to build it, or you can use what we've already put in there. That sounds like good. <laughs> That's actually, it's actually sounds, sounds pretty good. You can basically get to anything that we need. Um, what I'd like to actually do now is we saw actually a part before um, that was working on a three-axis machine and we just doing everything from one side. Now, what happens when you run into a part that looks like this? This looks a little that looks more like a pretty sophisticated part there. <laughs> actually, it is. It actually is. Uh, this particular part, if we're taking a look at it, I'll just zoom up into it a little. You can see that we have it on different levels different types of holes, tapped holes, we have counter, counter bore holes, but not only that, we have it on all different directions on the part itself, whether it be on the sides, whether it be on this angled surface here as well. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually machine this and program this for a five-axis machine which can handle indexial machining. Okay? Now, if I were to do this normally, on your normal, without having any kind of uh, process, I would have a lot of work to do over here to program every single one of these holes. Well, first of all, before I even start, let me just point out one thing. If I go into my coordinate system manager, you'll note I only have one MAC position over here. That's all I have over here, just one MAC position. Remember that because you'll be quite surprised a little later on. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the process a lot quicker this time than I did last time so you can see exactly what's going on. Okay, we'll click on operation just like last time and we'll go into whole, te uh, 
whole recognition and technology. You'll note we have our new technology database called <clears throat> Ken. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and we have the SHR. Now, what does SHR to... stand for, Sid? Actually, it's systems whole recognition. So it's the system it's database. It's what the system actually gives you. Okay. We'll click on that. And basically, we'll be going through the exact same motions that I did in the last part. Just because that part was a, was a three-axis machine and this one is working on a five-axis, multi-axis uh, part, it doesn't make a difference. The motions are the exact same thing. It recognizes the whole features exactly the way it did in the last part, shown over here. The machinable features breaks it up into the different groups, shows the feature set. Note it has only one feature set, but it's recognizing all of them. You'll be a little surprised shortly what happens. Then it builds the technology for all of them as shown over here. And then it builds the operations for every single one of those holes. Now, let it finish doing its, what it has to do. And you can see all of them have been built all the way down. And if I go out of here, if I exit, you can see all of them have been built. But not only that, let's go back to our coordinate system manager. If I go back to my coordinate system manager, you'll note that it automatically built a home position for every single direction that it needs to have a home position in order to drill out those holes. That was built automatically without me having to do anything about that. I think it's a very powerful uh, uh, part just right then and there. That looks to be an extremely powerful part. You got an awful lot of work done there in a very, very short period of time. Can you show the simulation on it? Sure. Not only will I show the simulation on it, but I'll even show the simulation using machine simulation. So we'll actually see exactly how it looks when you're working on the machine itself. Because this is really cool. This is a five-axis indexial part. And actually watching it turn around the machine itself, well... Gives you, a, gives you a pretty clear indication of what's actually going to happen on your machine, doesn't it? And it gives you an exact indication of what's, uh, what's going to happen on the machine. I'll just zoom in a little bit over here. Now, the first operations that you'll be seeing is I actually did some milling operations here as well just to rough out the uh, material as shown over there. So we'll go past that as soon as I can. Just speed it up a little. And now, as you see, I'm going to slow it down now. It's actually starting the actual milling, or I should say the whole operations needed to create those holes. Now we slow down just a little more. And you can see as it flips around on the part automatically according to the positions which were created automatically as well. Doing all the tapped holes, the regular holes. And in a moment you'll even see some of the counterbore holes being done as well. So this is really creating a, a pretty sophisticated set of tool paths here. Um, why don't you also, when you get a chance here when the simulation is finished, show us that we still have control over the order. Let's say, for instance, I'm using the same spot drill to machine several different hole features. I can run that same spot drill in order, can't I? Uh, yes, you can. So I'll let this finish off over here. We'll be done in a moment. Mm -hmm. As you see now, just milling out the counter bore holes, and we're finished on the part itself. Now, as Ken had just mentioned, uh, I'd like to actually uh, change the order a bit. In other words, we have all our sets over here, but I want to choose have my spot drill come in one after the other instead of switching back and forth all the time on the machine. Okay? Now, Let's go to our cam tree on the left-hand side, and you see we have all our sets as shown over here. Now, I can't 
change the order in the set itself because that would break the actual technology that I built and it won't allow me to do that. But what I can do is I can always move it up. As long as it stays above the, act the rest of the process, it's not a problem itself. So here we have, we, we see we have here T4, which is our spot drill. I want to take all of my spot drills and move them up. So I'll just, just mark all of them. I'll mark this one, next one. All of them I'll just mark. Go down a little on the part itself. Just simply mark all of them. And I believe we have a few more down there as well. And what's nice to see also that since it's broken up into groups, it's easy to pick them out as well. Okay, and we have this one and this one. We'll just leave it at that. And all I have to do now is take it and just drag it up until that spatula over there. I must have grabbed one that wasn't part of the uh, group. I'll just do a few just to give you the simple um, idea of what we're talking about. I'll just yeah, take these four just to give you an idea. Right just grab those and move them up. Yeah, that should be enough over there just to give you an idea. And you can see they have all been put one after the other. So this way you will save on uh, tool changing time as well. So as long as we're not violating the order of the individual process, we can then move tool or tools anywhere we want in the list to group them to to really take advantage of minimizing the amount of time we're switching back and forth in the tool change. That's correct. Very good. Okay, now be, before we finish off, um, I just like to mention to everyone that uh, if you want to have more information about the uh, automatic call recognition machining, you can easily go into our help that we have on top over here. If you go into help, we have what we call SolidCam Help Topics Milling. And inside our milling help, if you open it up, we have a whole section of automatic feature recognition and machining. Opening up, we have a basic explanation of exactly what we did here and even more so. So when you have some free time, or if you don't have free time but you want to use this anyway, it will be a good idea just to go through this and you can get a better idea of exactly what's going on. But using it is very simple. Just see exactly what I did and be able to use it very quickly. Well, that looks okay. pretty cool, Sid. We've yeah. got just a few minutes left. Um, yeah. If there's any questions, we can go into a short question and answer session here. If you have questions, there is a there's an area in your control panel for the webinar that says questions. If you'll type them in there, uh, we can do our best to answer your questions at this point before we run out of time here. I think we'll everyone is, looks like everyone is just high, with their mouth open with their jaws dropped down. <laughs> can't believe what they just saw. We hope so. We hope so. <laughs> Um, we'll give it a few more minutes. If any questions come in, we'll answer them. And uh, if not, then we will, uh, in about uh, two or three minutes here, we'll uh, go ahead and close the session unless we get some answered questions. Okay, no problem with that. Um, you know, really like what I like about this, Ken, is the fact that just the way you just picked it up on this five axis part. I mean, it. I just took this part just out of a collection of parts that I had and mm -hmm. I said let's see how it works on this part and I just put it in there and boom it just did every single hole exactly the way it should have done it. Yeah, that was amazing. It, it, it kind of looks to me uh, and the way I like to look at this is the, the only real limitation you have in, in how automated you can make this is basically your own creativity for building the structured logic ladders for how to choose the tools, how to determine when to use a particular operation, whether or not to use two drilling operations or one drilling operation. It's pretty flexible and you can you can hard code as much of this as you want so you can kind of work with it and grow with it as you get more and more knowledge of how this system works. You can continue to refine your database and make it stronger and stronger as you go along. 
Right. As, as we all know, no one can really dictate how you want your automation, and you always like to make it exactly the way you want it, which is why this is so, we made this uh, extremely easy to edit as well. Exactly. Exactly. Well, okay. We don't seem uh, to be having it? any questions come in, so it's. I see point. one question just came in. Uh huh. It says, how, uh, how are they. Uh, uh, how are holes that are defined in whole wizard as tapped as ream recognized? Uh, actually, we're we're pulling that data from what they call the extended hole uh, data uh, from within the actual whole wizard. So, if that is available to us through the whole wizard via the API, the application programming interface, we can get that parameter, and that's what we're using to determine what tap pitch to use. Okay, we have another question. Uh, looks like that was a good answer. And uh, we have one more question. How would you use a predefined tool table? Uh -huh. well, I think I can answer that actually. Yeah, why don't you okay. take it? I'll take it from there. Uh, very simple, if you have a predefined tool table, if you pre, if before you start, before you start your uh, your uh, hole recognition, you bring those tables into your part tool table. If those tools are meet the criteria for the tools that are needed in the operations itself, it will use those tools. It will not create new tools. Okay. By the way, we have plans also for later on that it will also, if it doesn't find it in your part, in your particular part tool table, it will uh, go to a specific assigned tool table as well, look at it there uh, later on. Well, that's, that's in the planning, but right now the tools that you have, if you pre-populate uh, pre, uh, your, your part tool table with the tools, it will recognize the tools and not create new tools. Okay. That seems like that's pretty strong, Sid. Yeah, it, it is. It really gives you a lot of capabilities, and um, it's pretty easy to take import tools from a standing tool table into the part tool table, so that's a, that's a pretty good solution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, now I'd just like to mention also to everyone that this uh, has been recorded uh, and will be available tomorrow on our website as well. So if you ever want to go over anything we've said over here, you're all free and welcome to uh, see the webinar over again on the uh, website itself. And the parts that I've used here will also be available uh, with the, those recordings as well. Okay, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining this webinar. We had a nice crowd here today. Uh, Ken, it was a real pleasure having you, with this, uh, having you joining us this webinar. It actually made it a lot more thank interesting. You. Well, thank you. My pleasure to be here. All right. Take care, everyone, and have a great weekend.